Father, we give you great praise and glory for who you are, and we're thankful for the day you've blessed us to have and to enjoy. Thank you again for allowing us the privilege of gathering together to study your word. We seek understanding from your truth. May your truth encourage and transform us. Lord, we pray your forgiveness of our sins, and we ask you to prepare our hearts and minds to receive what you have in store for us. Bless your people according to your will. You know their needs. Supply them as you see fit. Meet us now here. Guide us through your word. May your will be done. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, so we are continuing our look at Paul's letter to the Roman Christians, and we're picking up in chapter 8, and we're going to look at the, remain, the remaining 15 verses, um, excuse me, remaining 14 verses uh, of this 8th chapter. So what I want to do Hey, how are you? Read the 14 verses. I'm going to read them from the New King James Version. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God, excuse me, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right. Looking at verses 26 through 30. That first word in verse 26, likewise connects us to the groans we heard from creation and from the saints. Connects us back to the, gro the groans we heard from creation and from the saints. And we first saw that 
going back to verse number 21, 22. For we know the whole creation groans. Creation wants to be delivered from bondage. All right, and then in verse 23, we groan within ourselves. So when we look at verse 26, the likewise takes us back to the groans of creation and the saved people of God. Paul says the Holy Spirit helps us. He shares our load in prayer. We, we need not bear the burden of prayer. This is a supreme act of grace. So it reminds us and informs us when we pray, we're not praying by ourselves. When we pray, we have help. We have a supplement. We have a complement. Right? So we're bearing this burden, as the picture indicates, but God is praying for us and God is praying with us. This, this is so wondrous because we're praying to God with God's help. So God is ensuring our prayers and augmenting them with his presence. And so the Holy Spirit joins us, the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit joins us by carrying our burdens with us as he faces us. So when we engage in prayer, the Holy Spirit is standing with us face to face and lifting our petitions to the presence of the Father. And he's doing that constantly because that is his role as the paraclete, the comforter who comes alongside us. He's bearing that burden with us. Go quickly to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. The last five verses of Luke chapter 10 give us the story of Jesus being at Mary and Martha's house or Martha and Mary's house with his disciples. Martha is preparing the meal and she's concerned about housekeeping items. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. There in verse 40. King James Version, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him, that's Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Martha wanted Mary to help her deal with serving, with the priority, what she felt at, the, at that time was a priority of serving, of, of preparing the home, the house, the table, the meal. The word she uses for help me is the same word Paul uses about what the Holy Spirit does for us. Martha wanted Mary to come alongside her to ease the burden of preparing the meal and all of the accessories for Jesus' visit. She needed someone to be her burden bearer. That's who the Holy Spirit is for us. He helps us by bearing our burden. He doesn't carry it by himself. He helps us as we carry it. Because one of the weaknesses we have in prayer is we don't always know what we must pray for. There are certain things we have to pray for. And that's, again, King James, what we ought to pray or pray as we ought to. That language means there are certain things we must pray for, we need to pray for, the necessity for prayer. We don't always know that. So that's when the Holy Spirit comes along to make up for our ignorance in the, in the necessities of our prayers. That's a weakness. When, when we don't know what to pray for and prayer at its core, at its essence, is 
asking God for something? Well, when we don't know what to ask for, we need someone to help us discern and figure out what we should be praying for. So the Holy Spirit stands in that gap for us and offers requests on our behalf. Right? Goes before the Father in that glorious presence of the Lord. And he intercedes, he makes groans that are beyond our vocabulary. There is a Trinitarian language among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we mortal humans, we anthroposes, we will never understand. We will never know it. But that's how the Holy Spirit communicates with the Father on our behalf. So there in verse 27, Paul confirms a great truth in regard to the Holy Spirit's intercessory work. God knows our hearts. He knows the hearts of humankind. But obviously, the Father also knows the mind of the Spirit because they're one. So as God prays to God, as God intercedes for people in the presence of God, we have the assurance because of what Paul says, the Holy Spirit always prays according to the Father's will. And that gives us this great truth. Every time the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, prays with us, prays for us, the Father always gives a positive response. God never says no to himself. So within the Godhead, within the Trinity, God never says no because God always falls in line with or operates within his will. So when Jesus prayed, the Father responded and answered his prayers positively, affirmatively. The Holy Spirit has the same privilege, if you will. So when we look at Matthew 6.10, you don't have to go there, but in the model prayer, Jesus tells us to pray, thy will be done. The Holy Spirit is always prays within the will of God. The Holy Spirit always prays, Father, your will be done. And God has obligated himself to answering affirmatively any prayers that solicit his will. That's why we must ask God to show us his will, to help us discern his will, and then we pray God's will back to him as we seek to embrace his will. We get to verse 28, a verse almost every Christian can recite, has recite, will recite, because it seems relevant for every day of our lives. All things work together. Well, before we get to the all things working together, we need to start with the first three words, and we know. Because the emphasis of this verse, it does not lie in the synergy among all things. Synergy meaning working together. That's not the emphasis of this verse. The emphasis of the verse lies in our knowledge of this spiritual truth. Okay, all things work together for good, to produce good. But the emphasis is we know that. We need to know that. That this is something that ought not be 
a source of doubt or wavering. That's the emphasis on this verse. You go back to verse 26, when we talk about prayer and what we should pray for, Paul said, we don't know that. We don't always know that. So sometimes we, we, we may not be certain. Sometimes we have a very clear idea of what we need to pray for. Sometimes we don't. Each of us can testify if we're honest. There have been times we didn't know what to pray for. But in verse 28, Paul says, here's something we do know. We do know this. We do know about this synergy and the benefits of the synergy. We know this. All right. And this knowledge is not something we learn. It isn't it isn't the result of information that we've gained and acquired and obtained through experience. It's not something that someone necessarily taught and modeled for us over a period of time. No, this knowledge comes from accepting a statement, a declarative word from God simply on the basis of him saying it. So we've heard this before. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Well, whether you believe it or not, if God said it, that settles it. Our belief has no impact on what God has said. So whether we believe it or not is irrelevant as long as God said it. You need some Bible for that? Think about the flood. God said he's going to destroy the world with flood waters. Noah told people God said he was going to destroy the world with flood waters. There were many people who did not believe it. As a matter of fact, I would suggest everyone alive at that time except for eight. Everyone alive at that time, except for eight, did not believe it, did not stop God from bringing judgment. So we have a knowledge based on faith that accepts God at his word. If he said it, that settles it. I don't care how much you claim you don't believe in the law of gravity. You go up 30,000 feet in an airplane and you step out thinking you're going to walk on air. You got another thing coming. You don't have to believe in gravity in order for gravity to take effect. And I promise you, you know, it's not the falling that will kill you. It's that sudden stop that'll get you. So God doesn't need us and our belief to settle what he said. His word stands true by itself. He said, let there be light. Light came. We didn't have to believe it because we weren't even created yet. So this promise of, of synergy, working things together, it only applies to those who love God. It only applies to those to whom God has called for his purpose. The good news about that is that's us. We're the ones who love God. We're the ones, we saints have been called for his purpose. I really wish I had time to develop this and, 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 and to dig deep into it, but it's a survey, so I gotta keep it moving. But we are the ones who can lay hold to this promise. So in verses 29 and 30, we hear some language that may cause some trepidation and confusion. So I'm going to do my best as we are in this deep water to keep everyone's nostrils above water. So we're talking about foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. Okay. Let's do our best to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. God knew us before he made us. He knew us before he saved us. 
Think about what we see in Jeremiah. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knows everyone before he chooses to create us. Again, the advantage of being omniscient and eternal. God isn't learning anything. God simply knows everything. So be, his foreknowledge indicates he knew us before he made us. He had, he, he was acquainted with us. Again, because of his omniscience. And he desired a relationship with us before he made us. So because of that, God determined we would be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's what predestined means. A different word could be foreordained or ordained beforehand or determined beforehand. That's what predestined means. And that predestination is based on his before knowledge. So God determined, since he knew us, he would make certain we would become like the image or like Christ, an image of Christ. And we are begotten into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Again, we are saved. We are born again. From above, from the Spirit. Our life in Christ comes by the birth and conception of the Holy Spirit. So God knows us, and because of His foreknowledge, before He created us, before He saved us, He had already determined we would be like Jesus. Then he called us, and that call is his summons to salvation. Now, the foreknowledge and the predestination are events, I'll call them, that occurred outside of time. Theologians refer to this as eternity past. Again, because we are not eternal, we cannot fathom what eternity is. Because our point of reference always and only is in time. But God doesn't see the past from the future. He sees everything as is, as occurring right now and we can't maybe you can't i can't even I, I can't try to imagine that the things that happened to me 20 years ago and the things if i live 20 years more that will happen 20 years from now all happening in my estimation in my eyesight at one time i can't fathom that but god does but in order for us to kind of relate to god we have to use words like eternity past. So before the foundation of the world, God had foreknowledge and God predestined. The calling of God to salvation occurs inside time, which is what we call history. So the calling is the activation God uses to bring us into what he has determined for us. So his call activates his predetermination for us. And then Paul says, for whom he called, these he justified. And we saw in chapter five, verse one, we've been justified by faith. So again, through faith, God declared us righteous. And then finishing verse 30 of Romans 8, those whom he has declared righteous, he is also glorified. 
Now, we know our glorification is yet future. But God has already set or already established our glorification. And because he has already set it and already established it, he will not change it. He will not rescind it. Our glorification is not based on us. It is unconditional. It is based completely on his character. So he foreknew us. He predestined us to be like his son, Jesus. He called us. He justified us. He glorified us. Our glorification, we have not yet experienced that. That comes with our new bodies. All right. Again, can't spend much time there. Got to get through the entire book, the entire letter. So we now shift to verse 31. Because verse 31 starts a celebratory expression regarding our permanent place in God's grace. Question. Does that mean our life experiences, including the bad, is predestination to prepare us for activation? No, our activation has already happened. Our life experiences, including the bad, are God's methods, if you will, of our sanctification, of making us more like Christ, of conforming us into the image of Christ. So all of us is a work in progress. We have been justified. We know that. We've already seen that from previous chapters in Romans. Our glorification is future. We've not yet achieved that. Between those two is the journey of sanctification. So God uses our life experiences to chip away the sinfulness with which we were born so we can further manifest the righteousness we inherit from Jesus Christ. And again, I, I, I really wish I could set foot, drop anchor there in verse 28. Because God is, God is making certain all those things, the negative experiences that we have, I'll say just a quick tidbit about it. You think about the negative experiences Jesus had. Pick one, any one you can think of. How did he respond to those adversities? You know, scripture gives us several examples, but I'll, I'll pick one. Bible says they reviled against him, he reviled not. Now, if we are to be conformed to his image, we think about what happened when people reviled him, his response was to not return their reviling with reviling of his own. So that's the example, what should we do? Now, how many of us are guilty, and I say us, I didn't say you, how many of us are guilty of returning evil words for evil words, reviling for reviling. When we return reviling for reviling, are we conforming to the image of Christ? The answer is no. So the purpose of God determining our destiny to be like Christ is for us to exemplify what he did. Again, I could say more, but I don't want to get bogged down. There's just so much truth there. And I lack the discipline to cut it off so we don't fall behind. So again, verse 31 goes back 
to condemnation or our lack of condemnation. We have no condemnation. So since we don't have any condemnation, we're in Christ Jesus. Who can oppose us in regard to sin? We have to keep the context in mind. We are talking about our spiritual standing in God's sight. We're not talking about our physical standing or our earthly standing. We're talking about the spirit realm. Paul is discussing the spirit realm. The same God who freely gave us his son, who gave us his son without us having to pay for it, pay for him, pay for the gift of salvation through Christ. The, the, the same God who gave us as an act of grace, Jesus Christ. So we would not suffer the penalty of our sin. That same God will through that same grace give us everything we need to maintain the standing we have in Jesus. That same God. So now we get to verse 33. Paul asks a series of questions. We have no condemnation. That's how he started the chapter, verse 1. So since we are no longer condemned, Christ has paid the full penalty for our sins. Who can accuse us now? Since God has already justified us and the blood, the death of Christ covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. Who can bring an accusation of sin against us? Because the Father and the Son have disabled those accusations and disarmed them. So now, instead of the enemy having a loaded cannon on the battlefield, God has rendered him completely powerless with all the strength of a water pistol. That's why he says, oh, death, where is your sting? He has taken the sting out of the enemy's greatest weapon. He's taken, he's taken Satan's greatest hit. And he has made him or rendered him completely impotent. So since God has declared us righteous, there is no sin, no accusation, that can reclassify us as unrighteous. We are permanently categorized in the column of righteousness. Nothing can take us and put us back in the unrighteous category. And because Jesus, he's our high priest, he goes to God on our behalf, he makes petitions, and because of his sacrifice, his one-time sacrifice, he stands as our perpetual payment for punishment. So let's revisit Hebrews 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Join me at verse number 23. I'm going to read verses 23 through 27 from the New International Version. 
Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He always lives to intercede for them, always lives, never dies, never stops his intercessory ministry. Verse 26, such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, he's blameless, he's pure, he's set apart from sinners, and he's exalted above the heavens. Verse 27, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins. Again, he had no sins, so he need not repeat the offerings of sacrifices. First for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins, the sins of the people, once for all when he offered himself. So Christ as our high priest intercedes for us. And when the father needs an appropriate sacrifice of, of blood for the sins of the people for whom Jesus intercedes, Jesus need only show his scars. This is glorious. Go back to Romans 8. So, since we no longer have condemnation, and Scripture affirms Jesus never ceases interceding for us, what can tear us away from God's love? And I use that language, tear us away, on purpose. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10. Jesus is in me, in, in, um, he's responding to Pharisees' question about marriage and divorce. Let's start at verse 6 for the sake of context. Give ourselves a little bit of context of what the Lord is saying. Jesus says, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He quotes the scripture. Now he gives a little bit of exposition. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Right. In the King James Version, verse 9 reads, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That word separate from the New King James Version, or from Romans 8, separates from the love of God, is the same Greek word for put asunder in the King James of Mark 10, 9. It means divorce. I want us to get this, and I want us to keep getting this, and keep it in our minds, and never let it go. We're, we're, we're married to God. We're betrothed to the Lamb. And the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of the age, that would be the marriage between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Paul says, what will cause God to divorce us? That's what tear away means. What would cause God to divorce us? Now, some of some of you may know people, you, you may be divorced, you may know people who are divorced, and we've heard a variety of reasons why married couples divorce. And if there is no specific reason, then we, we, we chalk it up to irreconcilable differences. Well, Paul gives a list of possibilities, but none of them can 
tear us away from God's love in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? None of them can. So we, we look at the list there in, in Romans 8. All right. He starts in verse 35. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Shall any of those things that we experience, that we encounter, push God to divorce us, to tear himself away from us, to drive a wedge between us and himself? Paul says, listen, he quotes the scripture, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are like sheep going to slaughter. The sword has never been an instrument that separates God people from his love. God uses the sword as affirmation of his love for some. Because there are those who died, who've been martyred because of their love for Jesus. You think about um, you think about Stephen in Acts chapter 7. As he told the truth, he spoke the truth. The priests, the leaders did not want to hear it. They stoned him. And as he was receiving the stones, he looked up and saw in heaven Jesus applauding him. Death is not always a curse because of disobedience. Those who've been martyred stand as witnesses because of their faith and their love. And God received them. Paul says we are hyper conquerors. Greek word hooper nakao. It means excessive in victory. All right, and we get the word Nike, the the, the uh, athletic shoe Nike. Their their brand name comes from nakao, which means victory. Paul says we we are excessive in victory. I remember when the, the president made a a comment about the United States winning so much, we'll get tired of winning. We, we just get tired of winning. Listen, I never get tired of winning. Never. Winning can never get old. Now, we understand he was speaking in a political sense, in a national sense, understood. In Christ, we exceed in victory. That does not mean all of our circumstances will be positive or pleasant. What it means is when all the dust settles and the smoke clears, we emerge victorious. That's why Jesus says, I have overcome the world so we can be of good cheer. But we are more than conquerors. We are always victorious over the spiritual attacks of sin. Again, keep the context in mind. That does not mean we will walk through life without experiencing some heartache, some hurt, some trouble, some pain, some distress. That's not what that means. And if you look at the life of Paul, all throughout his Christian ministry, he suffered. What it means, what Paul is saying is, we never have to worry about those things overcoming us. So there in verse 38, Paul gives his testimony. He has processed all the evidence, all the reason necessary to make a proclamation, to make this proclamation. Nothing created by God has the power, the the dynamite, the dunamis, to trigger God to divorce us. Nothing. Why? Because the Father has committed himself to us through his Son, through Jesus, in a covenant he vowed he would never break. I think we'll stop there. 
our time is up. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us you are in this for the long run. And because you have promised and made a covenant with yourself, we are the beneficiaries of that promise, that covenant. We know we can be in it for the long run with you. Thank you for this great truth. Thank you for this great love. Thank you for this great salvation. Help us, Lord, even in the midst of our present circumstances, to always know nothing can separate us from your love. Have mercy upon us. Guide us and guard us by your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.